Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today at City Club's April 22nd Friday Forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, President of City Club, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here with us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS Radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today, our speaker, Gail Acterman, will discuss the future of Oregon's transportation systems, but first, a few announcements. To begin with, if you haven't already done so, please silence your cell phones. Next, I'd like to recognize one of our new City Club members, Brian Collins. If you could please stand, we'd like to welcome you. Your gift to City Club's spring annual fund campaign supports these forums, events, and research reports that City Club does that really have a big impact on shaping our community. For example, our current event series, From Crisis to Opportunity, Exploring Solutions to Oregon's Fiscal Challenges, examines innovative and long-term solutions to Oregon's fiscal crisis and is supported by the annual fund. Every donation helps maximize our ability to produce these programs, so please consider making a generous contribution today using one of the envelopes on your table, or you can donate online at www.pdxcityclub.org. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and I'd also like to offer our appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors whose generous financial support makes these forums possible. Please join me in thanking this quarter's sponsors, communications firm Morell Inc., utility company Northwest Natural, and the law firms of Perkins Coie and Schwabe Williamson and Wyatt. We are so grateful for your support. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club offices. And now to today's program. Oregon is often held up as a national model for transportation planning. Since 2000, state legislators have invested in railroads, ports, transit, and highways. The Oregon Department of Transportation has streamlined project delivery, and improved environmental results. The 2009 Jobs and Transportation Act ensured accountability and innovation in transportation funding, including funding for public transit. But the transportation revenue model is broken. Revenues flowing into the Federal Highway Trust Fund have fallen significantly due to higher gas prices, recession pressures, and the shift to alternative fuels. Meanwhile, state fuel tax revenue can only be used for highway transportation projects. So how do we meet the state's future needs for freight movement, mobility choices, and increased population while restoring the environment and neighborhoods? Today, our speaker, Gail Acterman, will attempt to answer this question. Gail has served on the Oregon Transportation Commission since 2000 and became chair in December 2007. She recently retired as director of the Institute for Natural Resources at Oregon State University. She's truly a renaissance woman, a lawyer, a teacher, a citizen volunteer, a biking enthusiast, an Oregon wine connoisseur, but most importantly, a passionate visionary on how we can sustainably integrate conservation and infrastructure development. So now please wel help me welcome today's speaker, Gail Acterman, and a City Club member. Thank you, Sharon. Today is Earth Day, and a lovely Earth Day it is. I don't think many of us have seen the sun in months. But it's a great day to talk about our transportation system and its transformation from a network of roads and highways to an integrated multimodal system that efficiently moves people and goods while restoring the environment, building community, and providing critical foundation for a robust economy. It's the transformation from a old transportation system to a new sustainable transportation system. As Sharon mentioned, Oregon has been a transportation leader 
for nearly a century, from adopting the first gas tax in the country in 1919 to being one of the first states to really integrate transportation and land use planning in the 1980s and the 1990s. And our leadership has delivered results. Oregon is the ninth most trade dependent state in the nation, producing and shipping goods worldwide, dependent on transportation. Our roads, our bridges, our highways are in better condition now than those in all, most other states. We consistently have top rankings in terms of pavement condition for the state system, and a recent report by Transportation for America ranked our bridges eighth best nationally. This is a real accomplishment. And we rank fifth nationally as a bicycle friendly state. So whether it's freight, roads and highways, or bicycle, we have built an extraordinary system. And we have to recognize, and I think too few people do, that transportation is really a vital service that we depend on every day to get to work, to visit family and friends, to explore our mountains, our beaches, rivers, really to explore the world. The transportation system truly is the foundation upon which our economy is built. It is extremely hard to trade goods if you can't get the goods to market and you can't get the materials you need to produce the goods to your business location. Frankly, I think most of us only realize how much we depend upon our transportation system until we don't have it because of something like a big flood or a landslide or a snowstorm that closes mountain passes and blocks and roads and shuts down the airports. Only in those times of crisis do we really think about how much we depend individually and collectively on our transportation services. This system of highways, roads, bridges, railroads, marine ports, airports is at great risk. And I hope you leave here today with an understanding of how big a risk this system faces. I want to explain the risk, but I also want to take time to explain the opportunity that we have here in Oregon to once again lead the nation in transportation reform a reform that's aimed at using transportation policy and transportation investment to restore the environment, build communities, and support economic development to truly create a new sustainable transportation system for the future. So let's start with where we are right now and how we got here. You know the story. It's been told countless times in books like Asphalt Nation, still stuck in traffic, the geography of nowhere, auto mania, or one of my favorites, the 1950s children's book, Make Way for the Highway, which has vivid pictures of birds and bunnies and grandmothers fleeing in front of bulldozers and cranes. Now, the good road movement of the early 20th century, getting us out of the mud, really was transformed into the road gang in the interstate era of the mid 20th century. And all too often, we have to acknowledge that the results destroyed the environment, fractured communities, and allowed our non-highway freight systems, rail and marine and air, particularly rail and marine, to languish. The good news is that here in Oregon, we got an early start on moving beyond the suburban sprawl of the interstate era. It took a lot of work by civic and business advocacy organizations, cities, counties, regional groups like Metro here in the Portland area, and many different state agencies. And here in this state, we have written new stories, like Joyride by our own Mia Burke about our bicycle system, and Growing Cooler a leading book on smart growth and climate change, co-authored by an alumni of Thousand Friends of Oregon. In 2006, at the Oregon Transportation Commission, we adopted a blueprint for what we think will be a sustainable, integrated transportation system that we want in the 21st century. And that blueprint is called the Oregon Transportation Plan, 
and we've been working from that blueprint ever since. The key priorities of the Oregon Transportation Plan are, number one, maintain what we have. It's a multi-billion, if not trillion dollar asset. Optimize the capacity of the existing system and safety by using information technology and other methods. There are half of the congestion on our roads and highways has nothing to do with how many lanes there are. It has to do with what highway planners call non-recurring results or non-recurring incidents, which you and I refer to as wrecks um, or bad driving. So we need to optimize the system, utilize all the capacity we have using new information technology. Third, we need to integrate, go even farther in integrating transportation and land use, transportation, economic development, and the environment. And finally, when we need to, we need to invest strategically in new capacity. So the Oregon Transportation Plan, it does provide a blueprint, it provides a focus, and it's not just for the Oregon Department of Transportation. Under Oregon law, the Transportation Plan uh, is a blueprint for all Oregon transportation, for city and county transportation plans, airports, marine ports, pipelines. The vision is to build an integrated transportation system, system's the important word, across all different modes and across all different jurisdictions to provide Oregonians and Oregon businesses with the transportation services that they need to thrive. A plan is necessary. Plans are great. But what really makes a difference is action. That's what makes a difference to all of you and all Oregonians. And frankly, I think you've begun to see the results of legislative action that actually started in 2002 after passage of the first Oregon Transportation Investment Act. That was followed by Connect Oregon, which is our the very first time that we've invested in multimodal transportation systems for both freight and transit. And then the OTA 3 bridge program, sometimes referred to as the Cracked Bridge program, which is a 10-year, $1.6 billion investment that has is resulted in our bridges coming up to being in the top ranks nationally. 2010 was the largest construction season in Oregon history with just in 2010, $727 million invested in transportation facilities throughout the state. And I think every one of you saw it because there were construction zones literally everywhere. And that was your dollars at work to rebuild our system. So I am extremely proud of what we've accomplished together with the city and county partners, railroads, business, private business partners, in terms of both the new policies and the on-the-ground results. But frankly, my eyes are now on the challenges that we face, and as I said to begin, the real risks that they present to us. The first big challenge is aging infrastructure. In spite of our recent investments, and they have been significant, our existing system is aging and deteriorating. Most of it was built in the interstate era 50, 60 years ago, and it was mostly built with federal funds, not state and local funds. And frankly, the same thing happens to roads and bridges and highways as happens to the human body. After 50, they start falling apart. <laughs> Their design life approaches and frankly, no one could see the volume of traffic and the mix of today's traffic, which is really quite different than what these facilities were designed to be used for. So the cracked bridges were just the beginning, and our, our repair and replacement liabilities are absolutely enormous. The safety, our safety, our quality of life, our economic competitiveness, are all at risk if we can't figure out how we are going to repair and replace the infrastructure that's already out here on the landscape. 
The only good news in the problem of our aging transportation infrastructure is that when we rebuild the system, we have an opportunity to do it sustainably, to restore the environment, connect communities, and meet today's economic needs as we rebuilt the infrastructure of the past. Beyond aging infrastructure, the second big challenge is demographic. Oregon is one of the fastest growing states in the country. Our population rose from 3.4 million people in the 2000 census to 3.8 million people in 2010. When you think about our transportation investments, we're building now the infrastructure that's going to be used by the next generation. When you build roads and bridges and highways and airports, you're building them for 30 to 50 years. That's your design life. Well, in 30 years, Oregon's population is forecast to reach 5.4 million, and most of those people are going to be living and working in the metropolitan regions, in Portland, Salem, Kaiser, Corvallis, Eugene, Springfield, the Rogue Valley, Central Oregon. That's 1.6 million people more than live here now. That's a 30% population increase in 30 years. And the thing that terrifies me is that those projections don't account for the millions more that I think are going to be moving here because of intolerable heat and water scarcity in the Southwest that's coming over the same time period as a result of climate change. Our roads and highways in our urban areas are, many of them are at capacity now. So the question is, how can we provide transportation service to another one and a half million people or more over the next 30 years? The third challenge, and it is the biggest one, is funding. Uh, there are total tr annual transportation revenue, all the money that comes in from state and federal sources for transportation in Oregon is $2.5 billion a year. That includes fuel taxes, weight mile taxes, license and registration fees, bond proceeds, and federal funds. And the federal funds are mostly federal gas taxes. When that money comes in, ODOT distributes about 40% of it to cities and counties and metropolitan planning organizations and to other state agencies. Well, when you think about $2.5 billion, it sounds like a lot of money, and there's no question that it is, but this transportation in terms of expenditures in our state budget, this doesn't, just doesn't count the city and county budgets, is only 7% of our total state budget, and unlike much of the rest of state government, the revenue comes almost entirely from users of the service. There is virtually no general fund in the budget. So taxing everyone who drives and uses our roads and highways has, since 1919, provided a reliable, fair source for funding transportation for decades. But as I'm going to explain in more detail later, and as Sharon touched on in the introduction, this revenue model is truly broken. We are about to fall off a cliff right at the same time that our needs and our costs of doing business are increasing, revenue is flat or declining. The challenge is even greater in Oregon than many other states because all of the revenue generated from fuel taxes, weight mile taxes, license and registration fees is constitutionally dedicated to the Highway Trust Fund. And what that means is that that money can only be used in highway and street rights of way. Can't be used for rail, can't be used to pay for buses, can't be used for anything but highway, roads and right, roads, et cetera. It's absolutely locked in the trust fund. So that really constrains us and prohibits us. Even if other modes are more cost effective, we have no money to invest in them. The National Trans Surface Transportation Infrastructure Financing Commission, long name, major effort to look at transportation finance nationally, 
found a large and widening gap between nationally between our needs for highway and transfer, transit funds and the available revenue. So this just, it, it's not even, it's not just an Oregon problem. And even with the recent uh, gas tax increase and fee increases with the Jobs and Transportation Act, we face the exact same large and widening gap. And bridging this gap is critical for our quality of life and for our economic competitiveness. I want to read a quote from Bill Galston of the Brookings Institute because I think it captures it all. And he wrote it to the president. We need to shift from spending to saving, from consumption to production, from deficit financed imports to aggressive export promotion. We need to invest in the basic building blocks of productivity and focus on good jobs that can't be exported. Infrastructure investment can contribute to all of these objectives. Anyone who has traveled outside the United States in recent years knows that we no longer have world-class infrastructure. And time-wasting, productivity-sapping bottlenecks are building up, especially in transportation. The National Commission and most experts recognize the financial crisis facing our transportation system and the importance for all of us of addressing it. The same cannot be said for the Republican leadership in Congress. The fiscal 2012 House budget proposal would cut federal transportation funding 30%. Cut it 30%. In Oregon, we would lose $150 million a year in annual highway funding if federal appropriations are limited to what's generated for the, high, the federal highway trust fund by the federal gas tax. This would be devastating to ODOT, but because of the pass through to local government, it would also be devastating to cities, counties, and transit districts that are already facing severe budget problems. The thing that was the most shocking to me with the Republican budget was Congressman Ryan's explanatory statement where he presents transportation not as a vital investment critical to making our nation more economically productive, he calls it wasteful. Transportation investment is wasteful. What doesn't he understand? Aging infrastructure, population growth, a broken revenue system, what's the answer? There really is a solution, a roadmap that would allow us to rebuild the deteriorating system into a seamless, well-connected network of transportation services, from bike paths and sidewalks, to streets, roads, highways, transit systems, to the railroads and port facilities that our businesses need. What's it going to take to build the system across hundreds of jurisdictions, special districts, and private businesses that now own and operate all the components of the transportation infrastructure that we use? The Oregon Transportation Plan is a start to getting us there. The 2009 Jobs and Transportation Act takes us a step further by adopting a really important new policy principle. Many of you recognize the term least cost planning because over the last 20 years we've transformed our energy sector by moving to a least cost planning approach. We are now, by the new Jobs and Transportation Act, required to use least cost planning as we approach transportation investments to compare the direct and indirect costs of both demand and supply options, not just the supply side of the equation, to meet our transportation goals, to really identify the most cost effective mix of transportation options. ODOT's working to develop the methods uh, for doing this right now I'm happy to say that uh, CH2M Hill and Sam Seskin here in Portland is one of our lead consultants on that, showing again our national leadership in this area. But what least cost solutions demand is multimodal solutions, multimodal approaches. So let's talk a bit about the solutions. Let's talk about how we can transform 
our system to one that is sustainable for the long term, how we can adopt transportation policies and make transportation investments that improve our economic competitiveness, restore the environment, and build vibrant, healthy communities. We actually have amazing opportunities right now because today is a time of truly revolutionary change in vehicle technology and information technology. We're at a time of radical change that is really equivalent to the revolutions that were brought about by the railroads in 1850s, by the automobiles in the early 1900s, and by commercial aviation in the mid-1950s. So I'm going to talk about this in terms of economic development, the environment, and communities. So starting out with economic development, we've already talked about how transportation is vital to the economy. And ODOT is now working very closely with our sister agency, Business Oregon, to make sure that the investments we make support economic development. And this doesn't mean just the roads and highways that are needed by business and industry. We have to make sure that workers can get to work on time and that goods can get to market on time. Oregon just released a comprehensive freight plan, the first one we've ever done. It's going to be finalized very shortly. And so we're going to have the guidance we need to improve freight connections to local, state, regional, national, and international markets by identifying strategic corridors and supply chains so that we can target the investments to the right choices and the right places. With Connect Oregon, which I mentioned earlier, for the first time we started to invest significantly in non-highway transportation, the ports, the airports, the rail facilities that businesses depend upon. We did, we've done three rounds of lottery-backed bonds with Connect Oregon, about $300 million, and we've been able to fund over 100 projects across the state, and one of the most important results is that we've built new relationships with the private railroads and with the local port districts where we're working together in entirely new ways. A fourth round of Connect Oregon funding is moving through the right legislature right now. It's for only 40 million, not the 100 million in the other three rounds. But if it isn't adopted, even at the $40 million level, we will have no way for continuing to pay for these extremely important non-highway projects. The next opportunity related to economic development is what a friend of mine at the University of Michigan calls the new mobility industry. You might not think of the new mobility industry as an industry cluster in Oregon, but through our transportation policies and investments, we actually create the opportunity for entirely new industries in Oregon. Uh, just last week, our own United Streetcar was featured on the White House blog as a shining example of the next generation of transportation and manufacturing jobs in the United States. This legislative session, the Oregon Innovation Council is seeking funding for Drive Oregon, which you may not have heard of, but it's a coalition of 30 companies, 30 companies that are really behind the electric vehicle movement, not just here, but nationally. Oregon is literally paving the way for electric vehicles to gain market share and we're attracting national and international recognition as a launch market for electric vehicles like the Nissan LEAF, which I had a, finally had a chance to drive on Wednesday of this, this week. But most important, beyond being a market for goods that are manufactured elsewhere, we have growing new and existing Oregon companies in this electric vehicle marketplace, Archimoto and Eugene, Entech, the battery manufacturer in Lebanon, uh, Bramo in Ashland, uh, Proteon in Portland. And the reason they're attracted here is because of a lot of the work we've done over past decades on land use transportation integration. Another sector, a completely different sector of the new mobility industry, really uses the latest information technology to provide innovative transportation solutions. You've probably all used ODOT's trip check to, see, to look and see what the mountain passes look like. What you probably don't know is that part of 
what the trip check group at ODOT does is set data standards to integrate traffic information from multiple sources and make it available to anyone. There are about 15 to 20 active users of this system, businesses that are creating new companies and new products to provide real-time predictive travel information and in-vehicle navigation systems, companies like TrafficCast and services like OnStar and General Motor Cars. Many of you probably use applications in your smartphones that have been developed using this data and they allow you to plan trips, avoid traffic jams, catch the next bus, you, the applications like beat the traffic. If you, in, in fact, if you have a map application on your cell phone or your iPad, you may have wondered where does the traffic information come from that shows up when you turn on the GPS? Well, it comes from ODOT system, but it also comes from all of your cell phones, which are sending data up, and that's being aggregated for companies like INREX that then provide it to Google and Apple and the rest of the folks that, uh, that uh, create the maps on your phone. Legislation now under consideration in the Oregon legislature is gonna take another really important step in this sector of IT and transportation when they will overcome the insurance coverage problem that is an obstacle to allowing real-time dynamic car sharing, allowing each one of you to turn your car, if you want to, into a bus and provide rides for your friends and neighbors and get paid for it or to pay your friends and neighbors to drive you so that you can share rides whenever and wherever you want to and get compensated for it. This is really just the beginning of a whole new way of social networking that pays for the, the drivers and also reduces driving alone. When you think about the rapid change we've all experienced as a result of telecommunications and information technology converging, and the telephone in your hand has been converted into a computer, Computer, uh, that is the kind of radical change that is gonna go on as information technology is integrated into motor vehicles and roads and highways. So things are changing fast and it's gonna get only faster. From economic development to the environment, we're working hard at ODOT to make sure that we make everyday Earth Day. Over my own 10 years on the commission, I think ODOT is alone has done a billion acts of green, as the sponsors of Earth Day are calling for today, and we've done it in many ways. First, we've done it through interagency coordination uh, because we've worked with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Environmental Quality to make sure that as we go about repairing and rehabilitating our bridges, we're achieving the objectives of the Oregon Conservation Strategy and meeting air and water quality standards. Second, we've done it through a truly revolutionary approach to project delivery uh, and environmental compliance. It's an outcome-based approach where ODOT sat down with all the state and federal regulatory agencies on the bridge program, agreed on the environmental outcomes that we were after, instead of designing things first and submitting it for permit review afterwards. And as a result, we were able to accelerate project delivery and get better environmental results. For every dollar we invested in doing this, we saved three dollars because of the savings on our project delivery schedules. And most important, we were able to work with organizations like the Nature Conservancy to help them double the size of one of their major preserves in the Rogue Valley of, for vernal pools, it's a very rare habitat, and create a mitigation bank for us so that any time an ODOT project in the future impacts this rare habitat, we will be continuing to make the contributions to this very large landscape scale restoration effort. Under the Jobs and Transportation Act, we're taking another step toward the environmental improvement as we move to practical design solutions that are sensitive to the communities where projects are located. The Sunrise Corridor project was gonna be a four lane freeway. We applied practical design approaches and that project is now going to be a two-lane road with limited access and interchange improvements that gets us the same results in a way that works much better 
for that Sunnyside area out on 205 and 212. Working with the Friends of Trees, ODOT is greening the I-205 multi-use pass. Shelly Romero here in front is, she's the queen of this effort along with Jason Tell, our region manager. Tomorrow, if you're interested, you can join Tom Hughes and John Kroger and others planting more of the thousands of trees that are being planted all along I-205 in one of the most economically and culturally diverse neighborhoods in Portland. Finally, on the environmental front, we are working closely with the Department of Land Conservation and Development and with the Oregon Department of Energy to address the 34% of our total greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon that are attributable to the transportation sector. ODOT was the first Department of Transportation anywhere in the country to install solar panels on our highway right-of-ways so that we can generate renewable energy in order to meet our own electricity needs. But much more important, we're building a toolkit on all the things you can do in the transportation sector to reduce GHG emissions so that metropolitan planning organizations throughout the state can develop their own customized strategy for emission reduction. Finally, before I move to the big question of funding, how can transportation policies and investments help build vibrant and healthy communities? I don't think most of us think about it, or most of the people in this room may not think about it, but transportation expenses are 20 to 30 percent of an average working family's expenses in any given month. It's a huge burden. And we need to provide those families with choices so that the only choice isn't driving a, in a, alone in a car. And the same challenge exists really for businesses, many of whom transportation is a significant expense there. And if they can only have one choice for a shipper, their costs of, of doing business also go up. So Connect Oregon helps provide these choices for businesses, but the Jobs and Transportation Act once again came up with a solution that's going to really help us provide these choices in neighborhoods and communities through a new program, it doesn't have a really great name, the Fe Flexible Funds Program, but it allows us to use all of our flexible federal funds to invest in non-highway projects, which will give people the choice to walk or ride a bike or take transit. Uh, and we have this funding source of about 20 to $25 million a year that we are now going to be investing in these kinds of opportunities. And just in the first round, there was tremendous demand for the program. Uh, we had $20 million to invest, and we got applications for $83 million worth of projects from around the state, and they were all worthwhile. It just shows the pent-up demand that we have to provide choices for people in neighborhoods in something other than a car. High-speed rail and rail infrastructure is another part of communities, revitalization of the rail system for passenger and freight. We recently completed a comprehensive rail study. We have the information we need to revitalize rail infrastructure. Next year, we're going to take delivery of two new trains that are being built now in Wisconsin and are going to allow us to maintain our Amtrak service in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and we have rebuilt freight facilities from expanding the Ramsey Rail Yard in North Portland to a new multimodal hub in, in uh, Central Oregon, a rail unit train yard. And our, we got federal high-speed rail funds that are helping us design solutions to unsnarl the tangle in what is known as the Portland Triangle, one of the most congested parts of the North American rail system. But we're never going to be able to revitalize either our passenger or our freight rail system without new sources of revenue to fund the work. And as we're sitting here today in downtown Portland, Bill Wyatt is leading a meeting out at the Port of Portland at the airport of the new rail funding task force, which has been charged with coming up with a new funding source for rail. So I hope you share my excitement about the opportunity that we have in the economy, the environment, and our communities to once again be transportation pioneers, to show what transportation policies and investments can do and why they're needed 
to improve economic competitiveness, restore the environment, and build healthy communities. But we can't get there if we don't fix our broken revenue model. It's broken for two reasons. First, we don't have any way to fund anything other than highways because of the Highway Trust Fund. And second, the revenue from the gas tax is dropping, as Sharon mentioned. You know, this isn't the first time we've had to radically retool our finance system for transportation. Many of you in this room probably don't know it, but 160 years ago, the Oregon legislature authorized the first plank road, our first highway. And at that time, they charged tolls, but another critical part of transportation funding was that every male person between the ages of 21 and 50 was required every year to spend one day working on road building and maintenance. So maybe we could go back to that approach and all the guys in the room could get out there with their shovels. So, you know, they, I think they, they woke up and realized maybe that wasn't so great, so we passed the gas tax in 1919. And it's been a fantastic tax. It assured that those who use the pay system pay for it at the pump. But why doesn't it work now? Well, first, it's not indexed to inflation. You know, between 1993, when we last raised it, until 2009, when we just raised it, the purchasing power dropped 33%. The fuel efficiency of vehicles is going up, so you actually pay less per mile driven today than you did in the 1970s. Electric cars and trucks don't use gas at all, so, but they do use the roads just the way everybody else does. And people are driving less because of high gas prices and, frankly, are changing demographics as people age and drive less. Now, the Surface Transportation Infrastructure Finance Commission uh, recognized the same problem. Any system that relies on petroleum-derived vehicle fuels isn't sustainable and is going to erode with all of these new technologies I talked about. There isn't a silver bullet, but the National Commission came to the same solution that the Oregon Road User Fee Task Force came to uh, several years ago, and that is that we need a new user pay charge based on a charge for every mile you travel, and rather than relying on a charge that's indirectly on the amount of fuel you consume. Ultimately, the National Commission, just like our Oregon Transportation Vision Commission, actually recommended that the chargers not just pay on the number of miles driven, but that other variables enter in, uh, so that the weight and kind of vehicle you were driving, the time and place of where you're driving would enter into the equation. It would create the same kind of pricing that's now used by almost every other utility where you have a base charge to cover the cost of providing the system and a congestion charge to optimize the use of the system through price signals. If we adopt this approach, I think we could also address the lack of funding for non-highway investment by dedicating that congestion pricing surcharge, if you will, over and above the base charge to fund non-highway investments. It would still take a constitutional amendment, but it would give us a new revenue stream to do that. And frankly, a mileage-based tax for road use isn't new in Oregon. We've been charging trucks this way for years with the weight mile tax. And we're already pioneering new technology for weight mile tax collection where we have trucking companies volunteering to use a smartphone application that we've developed that allows them to calculate and pay their weight mile tax entirely wirelessly with the smartphones in the trucks. They can pay everything online, much like you pay your electric bill based on how much power you use for the month, uh, and it saves them enormous amounts of paperwork. We tested a mileage-based system for cars with a dedicated proprietary device, and, but it raised a number of concerns. It raised privacy concerns, efficiency and fairness concerns, rate structure concerns, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about those and building on our experiments with the weight mile collection, collection with the smartphone app. 
And we believe that what we need to do is to provide motorists with choices on how you pay your tax and design an open source system like we have with TripCheck and the related programs where people can use simple, familiar technology. The open source approach, uh, it, it could be done in, a, in several different ways. You could choose how you want to do it. You could report annually by having one annual odometer reading and paying it all at once. Uh, you could run by a wireless hotspot, sort of like our way in motion spots, and have your odometer readings picked up that way. Or you could maybe use a GPS application in a smartphone or in your car to count and allocate the miles by location. Now, this last option could actually stimulate new services. Your cell phone company might compete to get your business and say, We'll, we want you to pay your tax with us, and if you do, we'll provide real-time traffic information for you that will help you avoid traffic jams. A bill that's now in the legislature would require electric vehicles to pay this way starting in 2014, and it'll allow us to test this new revenue model and let people really see how it would work. The rate per mile is still being debated, uh, it could go from about 1.43 cents a mile, which is about what you pay if you get 21 miles to the gallon, to about a half a cent a mile, which is what, if you're getting 50 miles per gallon in your Prius, that's about what you're paying. So the rate's still under discussion. But if we succeed in getting this legislation passed, we're going to continue in our pioneering tradition. We'd be the first state, we were the first state to adopt a gas tax, and with this legislation, we'd be the first state moving to replace it with a new, sustainable, fair system for the future. So today, Earth Day, many organizations are calling you on all of you, all of us, to show our support for a cleaner and healthier future. I hope you leave here today with a better understanding of the need to diversify our transportation portfolio in order to build a reliable, least cost, healthy transportation system, a transportation system that truly does improve economic competitiveness, restore our environment, and build vibrant communities. So here are three things that every one of you can do to help realize this vision. First, support that mileage-based tax on electric vehicles so that we can test out this model. Second, support funding for Drive Oregon and for another round of Connect Oregon funding so that we can build a new mobility industry here in Oregon. And finally, become familiar with your city, your county, your region's transportation system plans. Figure out where are they really spending the money? Are they investing in the transportation services you need and want? It's only through this kind of active civic engagement, which the City Club really embodies, that we can make the shift from asphalt nation to a sustainable transportation system for the 21st century. Thank you, Gail. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, uh, City Club Governor Promise King. Promise is the Executive Director of Oregon League of Minority Voters and also wrote on race and politics as a columnist for the Portland Tribune. He's been a City Club member since 2008. Promise? Thank you, Gail, for a very, very well delivered speech. Uh, I don't think Sharon will agree with you that once you turn 50, everything falls out. <laughs> uh, to a lot of people, transportation means a way of reaching their destination. To some, it's bread and butter issues. To some, it's conservation and environment, and it's vitality and rebirth of their community. To those who see transportation as a bread and butter issue, there has been a lot of complaints. They have 
waited for so long to see ODOT uh, plan a system that responds to the, that economic need. What I didn't hear anything around the wonderful things you're doing around civil rights and how how the need for civil rights, uh, how, in, how it interfaces with economic development in communities that are currently blighted. Could you please explain something about that? Certainly. I have to admit that the Oregon Department of Transportation has not had the record on civil rights and building opportunities and making opportunities available for the less advantaged people in the communities around the state as we would have liked to see. But I think that under Matt Garrett's leadership, we've really stepped up in recent years on multiple fronts, and I'm very proud of the record that we are in the process of achieving uh, in terms of making sure that people of color, minorities, are actually hired into apprentice programs, and most important, that they're actually put to work on our jobs. I had the opportunity to uh, tour our new Oregon Department of Transportation uh, headquarters building in Salem. That's a building job, not a road job. But on that job, we are exceeding what everyone thought were ridiculously aggressive targets on how many, I think it's like, it's over 30% of the people working on that job are people of color, minorities, or women. And uh, it's very impressive, and, the, and Hoffman Construction is very proud of the record that they've built. So I think that transportation investment does create jobs. We use stimulus dollars to create a lot of jobs. But an important part of doing that is to make sure that as we create those jobs, we create the jobs for the people who need them most. As always, we will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at a Friday forum is a privilege of City Club membership, so when you come up to the microphone to ask your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member. Um, if I raise my question mark card, it means that you haven't asked your question yet, and we'd like to hear it. I'm Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, we know we need to change, but do we mean it? And I submit that what we do with the Columbia River crossing is going to show how serious we are about change. For both freight and people, we're moving on rail on a bridge that's over 100 years old across the Columbia. This is the main north-south line on the west coast. And so, Let's prove that we are serious about change, and let's concentrate on that bridge. It's going to provide for commuter rail. It will provide for high-speed rail. It will provide for the movement of freight. How serious are we about that? We're very serious. It's why the bridge needs to be replaced. And I think the fact that the proposed bridge, I think the most important consideration for the Oregon Department of the Transportation Commission has been to make sure from a policy standpoint that when we rebuild and replace that bridge, that it include light rail, that it include bike ped facilities as well as the traditional highway facilities. The one thing we have not been able to do, and I know you would have liked it to have happened, is to have the, the freight railroad, which has a separate bridge, uh, join with us in planning one new facility instead of wanting to maintain their own existing separate bridge. Um, we are a government agency, but we have no regulatory authority over the private railroads. So we're addressing the rail considerations in a multimodal replacement bridge, even though it doesn't include the freight rail. And that is a very real need. Yes, sir. Uh, Fred Mathis, I'm a member and uh, retired family doctor. I believe in prevention. Some of the prevention we could begin right now is to enforce some of our laws. And we know that the heavy machinery traveling at excessive speeds is very hard on highways and bridges. Driving I-5, I have not been able to pass an 18-wheeler 
without exceeding 70 miles an hour. Why is the 55 mile limit on trucks not enforced? Great question and incredibly important point. The weight and speed of vehicles, it, it, it's stunning how dangerous high, trucks moving at high speed are. Um, we are, we don't fund, it's general funds up until now that, that funds state police traffic controls. But I will tell you what ODOT is doing to address the real problem that you've raised, and that is through our motor carrier division, we enforce the safety requirements for trucks. And we have been very aggressively moving on stings, uh, on enforcement actions with our own motor carrier enforcement people uh, to get out at uh, the, all of the aspects of truck speed and condition that affect highway safety. And uh, we've, it's been shocking um, how bad the problems were and it's been very encouraging to see what tremendous results we've gotten and to see the safety numbers on accidents with trucks involved plummet uh, in Oregon in recent years because of the education and enforcement efforts that we do. But it, it is a big problem and it's another reason we need funding for the state police. I, and I won't go into the question of whether it ought to come out of the Highway Trust Fund. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm David DeMarkey. I'm a City Club member. Uh, I appreciate your mentioning, uh, talking at some length about uh, electric cars. Uh, my question is that there seems to be two models emerging for maintaining the charge on electric cars. One is uh, the plug-in model at, at your destination. The other is the battery swap-out model that uh, nations such as uh, Israel is adopting. And it seems that here in Oregon, the emphasis is on the plug-in model. Uh, why have we chosen that path? And is there anything being done to um, promote the, the battery swap-out model? That's a great question. We have made a very firm policy decision going into the electric vehicle uh, movement that we are agnostic on the technology as an agency. And we have met with uh, Better Place, the company that uses the battery swap out model. We have signed memoranda of understanding with most of the electric vehicle manufacturers internationally. I, we were ready to sign one with Better Place in terms of facilitating their entry into this market. I do not believe that they wanted, that they decided to go ahead with that. The one thing that I would say in terms of why I think the plug-in model is moving forward faster uh, is that, and this is just me talking and I'm a lawyer, not a technology person, uh, is that if you use the battery swap out model, you've got to have one kind of car and you've got to go to one place to swap the batteries out. So you, you basically have dedicated proprietary battery technology. And I think that what's happening is that we're developing, uh, there's, an internet, there's a national and international standard being developed for the plugs that anybody can use and companies can compete. So I just think you've got a lot more competition in the plug-in sector than you do in the battery swap out. But from a matter of state policy, we'll work with anyone to help them develop the market however they want, however we can. Yes, sir. Yes, Lee Stevenson Kuhn, member, um, chair of the City Club uh, Advocacy Committee with the, advocating the adoption of recommendations in this report, moving forward a better way to govern regional transportation. Thank you. Uh, and, and Gail, I want to thank you for your wake-up call, for your vision, and your dedicated public service. Now, I have to get to a question pretty qu quick. All right, uh, House Bill 2001, we all know as the six cent uh, fuel tax increase. Um, that had two important areas to our committee. Um, and one is the funding, but you've already addressed that issue. The other is changing governance and how we get better transportation governance. Um, and what it did was it, it asked the um, interim committees from the House and the Senate starting in 2009 to study best practices 
to make recommendations and to prepare legislation for the current session. When we look, we can't find any evidence that that's ever been done. It hasn't. It hasn't, thank you. Uh, and we think that it's a good thing if they did it. We do too. Uh, so, all right. <laughs> do you, uh, then I think the answer is yes <laughs> to one question, but I have a second. Do you agree that better alignment of resources greater program efficiency and enhanced regional decision making are worthwhile governance changes? Yes. <laughs> Second question. What should, be, what should be done to achieve better governance? Well, from the Department of Transportation, from the Transportation Commission standpoint, the critical thing that I want to see us do is really build on the model that we've developed with the Area Commissions on Transportation, where we bring all the cities and the counties and the private sector and the NGO and neighborhood groups together to talk about transportation policy plans and investments at a regional scale. And what we're trying to do at uh, ODOT is really, is, is really expand the reach of the Area Commissions, give them additional support where we can, make sure that the few areas of the state where we don't have area commissions get them, uh, because we think that's the right forum for this conversation. And there's a great discussion of this issue if you want to read and learn more about it in a report that's recently come out from the Oregon, planning, Oregon chapter of the American Planning Association that's generally on regional planning and regional development and has very good insights into transportation as a part of that. We have run out of time today for further questions. Join us next week for a talk by the President and CEO of the Humane Society of the United States, Wayne Pacelli. And as we close, please join me again in expressing our appreciation to today's guest, Gail Ackerman. We're adjourned.